Hello again, everybody. This is James Bartley, and you're watching and listening to the Cosmic Switchboard Show. Today, my very special guest is Gary Wayne, uh, the Genesis 6 Conspiracy website. And Gary's got a lot of information to share, so much going on in the world, but at the same time, so much of it, if not all of it, ties back to what we call ancient times and the gods, demigods, and whatnot, who ran amok back in the old days while well, they really haven't gone anywhere. So Gary's going to fill us in on all of that stuff. So without any further ado, Gary Wayne, welcome to the Cosmic Switchboard Show. Well, thank you for inviting me and so happy to be here and looking forward to talking about some of my research with your audience. I think they might find it a little bit eyebrow raising and hopefully very interesting. Well, tell us a bit about yourself, Gary, your voyage of self-discovery. How did you eventually find your way to this information? And, you know, when was yeah. the proverbial light bulb uh, moment? Well, it was very slow in coming about in terms of the aspects of the conspiracy in the ancient times and the biblical stuff in the books. So it starts back in about 1980. And I'm, you know, out of school, I'm working. Um, typically been brainwashed by the education system and have moved away from God. And I'm sitting with my brother and one of his friends and we're having beers late into the night and stuff. And one of them says, uh, you know, how much courage do you have? <laughs> and I said, you know, being that young going, you know, like I'm not afraid of anything. So I said, well, do you have enough courage to read a book? And I said, on well, what book might that be? And so I was expecting them maybe to say the Bible or some other religious book or, or whatever. And so they said, uh, no, um, each of your brother and I have read this book called The Late Great Planet Earth by an author named Hal Lindsey. And he was a very famous writer back in the 70s and early 80s and probably even started in the 60s. And it's a prophecy book. And I said, well, I'll read it. Why, you know, why would I be afraid of it? They said, well, you better be comfortable with things like demons and fallen angels and uh, antichrist and false prophet and everything. Otherwise, don't go, you know, in that direction because you know, it may it, it may cause you more grief than um, enlightenment type of thing. So I said, no, no, I'll read it. So I read it and it scared the socks off of me. <laughs> and so I thought I better verify what Hal was talking about because a lot of people manipulate things and they take things out of context. They're not accurate. They have a contrived agenda. And I didn't know Hal Lindsey from anybody other than he's a minister and that he wrote a book that, you know, scared the socks off of me. So the only way I could verify that was start looking up the chapters in, 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 in the Bible. And so I found, you know, he's quoting them right. I don't know whether he's interpreting them right, but seems to be fairly legitimate. So I need to um, go to the next step and I need to understand this more. And so the only way to do that, you got to start reading the Bible. And then I start reading about things all throughout the Bible, a lot of prophecy and so I get done reading the Bible, I'm going, you know what, I, there's so much material in there and it goes in a thousand different directions with different sort of narratives and stuff. The only way I can get my head around this is I need to start from the beginning and I started doing handwritten files on what I wanted to follow was the various prophet, prophecy narratives because I'm a prophecy buff as it turns out now after doing this. And then it, it will coalesce with my early life history and reading that. I used to love reading history and mythology as I start to progress. So I logged all of that as much as I could. And hopefully, you know, obviously I missed some verses. And as I went, I added more in there. But then I started to say, okay, can I put these verses together in some sort of prophecy streams? I can tell a story. And so I put them not necessarily in that way to publish, but just for my own understanding, group them together, list them all, make sure everything fits. And then when I did that, I thought, you know what, I've got probably 10 or 15 books here I can write, and maybe I want to try and see whether or not I can get published. So I thought, 
let's see whether I can get published. Let's see whether or not people will actually buy my book and read my book and whether or not I've got any sort of avenue here to write all of these books I've got running around in my head that I like to do. And so in about 1995 or so, I start to think about what that book's going to look like. And I decide on doing a short book. And so I wanted to do a book on prophecy, but connect these really odd things that I went and annotated as I went through the Bible. And it starts obviously in Genesis 6 with these giants. And, you know, when I first read, I went, well, I'm just not dealing with that. But then you read about after the flood, you get all these different tribes and things that, excuse me, all these different tribes uh, that are giants after the flood. And people don't always recognize them. And I certainly didn't at the beginning, but I recognized there were some giants. I'm going, wait a minute, how did giants show up both before and after the flood? So the thought was, is how do I connect Genesis 6 with end time prophecy? And that was sort of the 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 short book that i wanted to write to see whether i could publish so i wrote the first 10 chapters very very quickly but then i thought you know what i know that what genesis 6 is talking about in the early post diluvian period matches up very very well with a lot of things i read in mythology and legend and other cultures history so why don't i just blend that in because i see some parallels through a different lens one's a polytheist lens one's a monotheist lens but I see similarities so I started to add that in and then I thought well that's not really complete because those legends and myths are based on their religions They're, you can't sort of separate them it's part of the culture the organizational structure in those uh, legends in those countries whether it's Greece or it's Sumeria or wherever and so then I started to research those religions and then I understand that there's a segment in there that is called the mystery schools where they're developing their religion and their knowledge and they're teaching this. And then I understand that from where I read that, this leads me into researching these secret societies that extend out of these mystery schools. And then that sent me down rabbit holes. So for years and years and years and years and years, and every time I thought I was finished the book, and I wanted to be finished the book, I would be led or somebody would send me a book out of nowhere that I wasn't wanting to look at, I wasn't wanting to include, I did not want to read. But then I would get this overwhelming push that I would need, I need to read this. And then I find out I need to put this in my book. <laughs> and I would keep sort of adding. And so the book was kind of finished somewhere around 2013. Um, and I still continued to add to it at that point, even though I had put, started to put together proposals and try and figure out, can I get uh, published? And so it was published in 2015, and I ended up with almost 1,200 pages. So I, had, I edited it down before I sent them in the, the manuscript that I wanted them to start editing for me. And I took that down to just over 800 pages. So I took a lot of stuff out. And the point on that is, is you could research forever. There's just so much material. And so it came together as a conspiracy book, not by intent, but because of the secret societies and the mystery schools and that their joint histories that they've been at, at odds and trying to enslave humankind from the beginning and have continued to do so all throughout history. So that's how it all came about. So a lot of years of work in history, and I keep sort of adding to the body of the research as I go, not in this book, but in documents that I have. And so I've got even more books I can, I can write if I can sort of become a little more disciplined and spend a little bit more time writing for a book. And I've got a book started on end time prophecy, but that's sort of the how it, how it all came about. And a lot of times, and if people read, it, read in my introduction of the book, is that I dropped it like a hot potato many times because I thought I was going crazy. I thought nobody's going to believe this. You know, and this starts to happen not at the beginning as, a, as sort of out there as giants and the flood story and everything is to, to most of the world, but with the secret society stuff that have a same sort of view on things just from a polytheist lens and that everything's kind of connected. And so I would stop, 
you know, for a month or, or so. And, but I hear this calling to, to come back and settle down and continue, just sort of have faith as sort of the feeling is have faith that you need to do this. And so I did. And uh, then, uh, you know, I was fearful when I got published. Well, what, what, what would happen? Like, would people read it? Would people want to uh, track me down and all sorts of things? So it's been quite a process and not a linear process. So like I said, from a short book to somewhere on the way to the Colosseum, so to speak, I got sidetracked a, a lot of times. And this, this is the end product of all of those changes. What is the thesis of the book? How, how have you coalesced all these uh, seemingly disparate strands and formed a thesis and crystallized uh, the message? Yeah, yeah, and and the difficulty of that is is to have it weave through the the whole book and be consistent, right? And that that took a lot of time to do. So. One of the ways I thought I needed to do this because I realized it was getting to be a large book was to write mini stories. So each chapter is a story in itself that leads into the next chapter and will keep coming up in subsequent chapters down the road. And that's sort of how I did it. And I thought, let's start not right at the beginning, but let's start in Genesis 6. And so that's why I picked the Genesis 6 conspiracy. And then as I get into it, I actually talk about it while it's part of a bigger conspiracy with the fallen angels. And by chapter 13, I'm into Lucifer's Revenge is the name of the chapter. And then I start to sort of bring all of that back into the mix of what's going on in prehistory and then sort of roll that forward through the antediluvian period, which if people aren't familiar with that term, it's before the flood. And then the early post-Diluvian world, including the Nephilim Wars and um, all the things that impacted Abraham and Moses at that time, and then into modern times, and then into um, the end time. And then I go back again, and I reweave in, in the last three sections, more polytheist information as to how, how and what they're doing with their belief system. And what I try and underline with people is it's not important that you believe what they're saying. What's important is they believe what they're saying and what they're doing with that information. And that's what we have to be, be aware of. So I let, from all these different sources, and I have over 100 pages of footnotes in the book, I let them speak for themselves. And it is an extraordinary amount of sources from you know, biblical, not biblical, but scriptural books in those religions, to secret societies, to historians. Um, and so I let them speak for themselves and use their words and then say, and here's what the, how it sort of matches up with the monotheist lens of that same parallel set of events. Giants play a crucial role in this. And even in recent times, we've heard stories, the Kandahar giant, uh, some of the ETs that people have encountered uh, over the years, over the millennia, have been, well, are, are essentially giants, large uh, humanoid beings. The Genesis 6 conspiracy at, at the outset, you focused on the giants. Could you tell us about their role? Were they a civilization unto themselves or were they being utilized by someone or something? Yeah. It's a good question. And so the first thing is that I would throw out for the audience is that when I first read Genesis 6, 1 to 4, even though I found it absolutely bizarre and didn't want to deal with it, I understood what they were saying right out of the beginning. What surprised me was that how so many Christians and ministers and seminary schools don't teach that doctrine. Like they try and change the meaning of it. So I had to learn all about that. And so I wanted to be comfortable with the idea about the veracity of these were actually giants. And again, you know, for people who are listening, uh, I, I can go through some of the details if you like, but uh, I have documents 
that are in support of the book and they're very detailed documents. I can't put that much detail in the book, but if you want to know how we know the sons of God are angels, I have a document for that. If you want to know why they're not the sons of God of the New Testament and or Sethites, I've got a document for that. So I've got lots of documents for people because I always measure everything against what the Bible says, right? As opposed to try and match the Bible up with what others say, whether scriptures, historians, whatever. And so in the book, I, I will give the examples and I'll show here's where it fits or it doesn't fit with the Bible so that people sort of understand because I'm a Christian, but I'm a Christian contrarian and I like to verify everything myself. And so that's how I approach things. So when we look at starting with these giants and we understand that the sons of God, as they're talked about in Job uh, 2, 6, Job 1, 34, 4 through 7, or the children of God in sons uh, in, in the council of gods in Psalms 82, and the host of heaven, and the stars, and the angels, and knowing that they're all linked together and with mat matching pairs, which links all four in the sort of aggregate number of verses that they're all talking about a hierarchy and an army and or thousands and different levels of angels. And one of them is the sons of God, which I think are the watchers that first Enoch talks about, which are the watchers in Daniel four that's used three times. And those are the seraphim angels, part of the watchers. There's three groups of watchers, uh, seraphim, Ophanim, which isn't listed in the Bible, but that's the word for the wheel in Ezekiel one and Ezekiel 10, which are the cherubim like, um, angels within the wheels but they have one face like a cherub so they're slightly different and that's the hebrew word ofan there's another word gigel that's hebrew as well but and it's also used throughout there but when it's talking about the beings within the wheels then that's when they're talking about the ofan and the i am is the male plural which you get ofanim that first Enoch talks about and then you have the cherubim uh, as well as the watchers there are also archangels but they're not part of the watchers Although you could have a seraphim that is part uh, archon, archangel as well. Uh, some angels have more than one trait. Uh, Satan would be an example. He has several traits. Uh, I won't go into that right now. So that's how we know just sort of quickly that these are actually angels and they produce these giants in Genesis 6, 1 through 4. And these are the giants that are around from the generation of Noah and or Jared, as it would re be referred to in, in, the, in the book of Enoch. And this is the sixth generation. So you've got uh, the generation that's following with the descendants of Cain, who are going away from God and are developing what the polytheists call the seven sacred sciences, which we know are the seven liberal sciences today and reinstated with the Royal Society starting in 1662 as the last of the sorcerers and the first of the scientists as they like to call themselves, but that's another rabbit hole. And this is the knowledge that is going to be, that is learned from Cain from Adam, that Adam learned in Eden to manage this huge agrarian project that had four rivers and had animals in it and had orchards and it had grain fields and, you know, needed some significant knowledge that was probably taught to him from God is certainly how I would understand that. And from the descriptions that we get in Genesis 2 as to what Eden was like. And so this is the knowledge that goes down to Cain that he passes on to his first son, Enoch, and understand there's two Enochs in Genesis. It's very important. Uh, one is the son of Cain, and then the one is the son of Jared in uh, the Sethian line. And there are several names that are the same, which the polytheist forces like to conflate, to confuse people. And he develops these into the seven sciences. These are the sciences that are going to be matched up with what Enoch would talk about in terms of the illicit knowledge that's added to that from heaven or what the knowledge that the gods provide in polytheist cult cultures that takes this knowledge to a whole new level. So at this point in time, then you get the creation of the giants. And they're there as part of the organizational structure 
to usurp the kingships and gain control and implement a religion that comes out of this knowledge that's called the mystical sun worshiping Enochian mysticism and also had you know, part of that symbolism is the bull cult. So they're going to implement those priests, that knowledge, the partnership with the with the angels and with the Nephilim to take over the world and parade humankind off the cliff so that they would be destroyed into destiny. Their job is to ensure humans don't reach their destiny of being resurrected to be like angels and to judge the angels that did all of the crimes against humanity before the flood. And so the angels um, rebelled before that. And that's why by chapter 13, I'll start to sort of get into that aspect. And it's these angels that are guiding this whole sort of plot. So we need to understand that these were the royal families and the elite before the flood. We need to understand that all of the priests and the teachers were the bloodlines and the elite before the flood. And they essentially enslaved humankind to pervert them, corrupt them, and to make sure that they would never reach uh, their destiny of being resurrected in, into heaven and understand they don't know how God plans to resurrect them or that he's going to resurrect them. They're just trying to destroy humankind. And the reason why I say that is the book of Corinthians says that if the fallen angels had understood the resurrection, they would never have permitted Jesus to be crucified. <laughs> So we know they didn't understand that that God knew knew how to how this was all going to play out and was going to let things play out through free choice. So this is the organizational structure that crosses the flood and sets up the same thing. So you have this elite feudal system that is coming down through history that has manipulated the world and has been trying to redo that rebellion that happened in Genesis 6 and will come full about in, in the end time. So these giants, they're kind of being pushed out and wiped out after early after the post-Diluvian flood. It might take a thousand years or so, but they kind of sort of blend into the countryside, but as the rulers and with diluted bloodlines. So when we get the mythos about the aliens, and that comes out of the alien mythos of that, what they're talking about with the different varieties of the aliens that you're talking about, whether or not it's the little people like the elementals, which uh, you've got four different groups, three of them are the most common ones, then they are ugly ones like gnomes and trolls and dwarves. You've got um, mischievous ones like the leprechauns and you've got good looking ones um, like the white elves or um, I'm trying to think of the fairy that's in Peter Pond, the one that's got flying wings, like named Tinkerbell, <laughs> like good looking ones, right? And then you've got a fourth one that's a little higher called salamanders, and they're kind of reptilian beings. And all of these four represent in the occult, like earth, wind, fire, those four different categories. So within that elemental ugly column, you have the gnomes, and they're in charge in the occult history of the genealogies the knowledge and the technology. These have the same description and the same kinds of flying machines that come through portals, fairy mounds, domens, things like that. Uh, and they're actually called the greys or the gray neighbors in Scotland. And they are identical to the gray aliens. So there's different kinds of these beings that are all sort of reflected into prehistory. And so what I think is what's going on is you have a combination of what these aliens are. Uh, whether or not there's actually any physical Nephilim that have survived, held in stasis, were off planet, whatever, it's a possibility. Uh, I don't have any evidence to suggest that there's these uh, Nephilim aliens today, but th we may see them again. I think we have the descendants of the Nephilim. But we ha also have a lot of information, though, on other kinds of aliens. So that would be part of the elementals. And we also know that angels have shape-shifting capability. And the reason why we know they have shape-shifting capability is because they're spirit beings in the spirit realm. But in the Bible, we get lots of examples of them taking different forms and shapes. 
Sometimes they're known as angels, sometimes they're not. So in the Sodom and Abraham narrative that leads out of, uh, Sodom leads out of the Abraham narrative, they look like men. They physically eat, talk, interact, touch, feel, um, and they're not really recognized at first as angels, but certainly by the time at Sodom, the people of Sodom know that they're angels. <laughs> And they want to have sex with them, <laughs> which is, you know, kind of a bizarre thing that they want to have sex with, uh, with these angels. So it's either that homosexuality aspect or they know they have a changeling ability that they could maybe change their sex. Right. But it's this changeling ability that also allows them to reproduce with human daughters to produce the, the sons of God. So they need in this universe or this physical universe, they need a dwelling place for that spirit to become uh, flesh. And that's the word habitation. That's in Jude 1, 6, where they left their habitation. That means a dwelling place. So they left their dwelling place in heaven, just as 2 Corinthians 5 is the only time that Greek word, Greek word is used, which is oiketarian, uh, which is house in heaven. And talking about in both there and in First Corinthians about the clothes of heaven and the clothes of, of the physical world. So you need, they need, you need a dwelling place for the spirit in this physical world. And that is created within the body and the soul, which is of this world. And then they put their spirit being from the uh, spiritual world into that body and then can in inter interact. That's why demons, who are the bodiless spirits of these giants they weren't allowed to go to sleep and they weren't allowed into heaven because they were counterfeit spirits made by the fallen angels through reproduction illegally they're always looking to possess a human so that they have a dwelling place for their spirit that they can interact with the world trouble is it's never a symbiotic relationship <laughs> they have to suppress the spirit that's that's already in there and that's why there's a war going on so i know i've kind of digressed and gone down a couple of rabbit holes but i was just sort of trying to explain how we know that angels can take all these different forms because not all of them are in the abyss only the impassioned and the worst of the ones went into the abyss before the flood and if there was a second incursion, which I sort of favor after the flood, then those ones would have gone to the abyss as well. And then would have been replaced by other uh, angels who are going to rule the council of gods in Psalm 82 over the seven, 70 nations in Deuteronomy 28. And you're going to have um, those ones who recreated Nephilim after the flood, they probably would have recreated many of those secondary beings that polytheism talks about a lot after the flood as well so that they would have recreated the elementals just as they recreated the nephilim they probably recreated maybe bigfoot so you can sort of understand sort of the the commonality in the thread there as to second incursion to first incursion as opposed to surviving the flood because all of these beings would have been wiped out by the flood or they were off world or in the earth or on the ark some way, which gets a little bit more complicated to try and reconcile with scripture. But what we're, and we're not told exactly how the giant survived the flood, only that they do because they're reckoned with as giants, which it doesn't go back to Nephilim except for in Numbers 13.33 talking about the Anakim, but giants in after the flood go back to the Hebrew word Rapha or Raphaim. So the Anak that are described as an embellishment in the evil report in Numbers 13.33 is trying to scare the Israelites talking about the Anak. And those three kings that are listed are Telmai, Sheshi, and Ahiman. And in Deuteronomy 2, we understand that the Anakim, along with the Emim, along with the Horim and other tribes, are all giants, which is the word Raphaim. So the Anakim are the giants. They're just not as big as the Antediluvian giants. And the disloyal scouts are trying to scare the Israelites against God's wishes. So I know I went for on for a long time, but I think it's probably time to let you back in. <laughs> oh, no, that was, that was very interesting. And, and, you know, got the wheels turning in my head. Uh, just a couple of definitions. Uh, what do you mean by the abyss? And also uh, Nephilim comes under 
as you know, different interpretations depending depending on. I'm sorry, the asthma is playing up. Uh, depending on you know the Bible or the variation of the Bible, some people refer to the Nephilim as men of great renown, or et cetera, et cetera. So if you can give sure. us a definition of uh, uh, your definition of abyss and Nephilim, that would be very helpful. So the abyss is used in two different ways in the Bible. One is for the great waters of the sea. So you have to understand the context that's being used in. And the other one is a prison. So the Old Testament will call it a prison that the angels were sent to and some of the Raphaim and Nephilim were sent to. And that is the bottomless pit that is also called in Revelations. Although some translations might say abyss there. And the abyss is in the place known as Hades in the Greek and in some of the definitions for the words used in the New Testament and Sheol, uh, which is the Hebrew word for the underworld in the Old Testament. And unfortunately, what the translator did is they conflated the abyss, uh, Sheol, and the lake of fire into one word called hell. And there's three distinctions in there and, and you need to understand the context and if you start to read that word hell or what are they talking about are they talking about the abyss prison are they for the angels are they talking about the underworld or are they talking about the lake of fire so it's important to to understand that distinction and and that's the prison that is that is talked about that these angels and beings are going to be released in in revelation 9 in the end time so we're going to see these things again in the end time. That's why it's important to understand that. And one of the things I try and get people to understand is that I, I hope you're learning about prophecy because I know the churches don't teach prophecy and they don't teach prehistory properly. But if you are, my advice is to learn about prehistory because to understand prophecy, you need to understand what happened in prehistory and the terms and the allegories that are applied in prophecy that relate things back. So if you, if you don't haven't properly understood prehistory in Genesis 6, 1 through 4, it's hard to get the full feel for the impact over prophecy, history, and what's going to happen in the end time. Now, in the Bible, when it talks about giants, I already talked about the two distinctions, one being the Rephaim and one being the, uh, the Nephilim. The Nephilim are the giants before the flood. And what's interesting about Numbers 13, 33, when they use that word twice, and it's only used one other time in the Bible, Nephilim, comes from the root word nephil, I am is the male plural, just as when you're using seraphim, that's the I am male plural from seraph. The other time is in Genesis 6-4. All the other times in the Bible, except for one time, it goes back to Rapha and Raphaim. And Raphaim actually shows up in the Bible as in Genesis 14 in the War of Giants, for example. And so you also have that word, um, giant that is rooted back to another world called Gibor and Giborim, as opposed to Giborah, which would be the female uh, application that is used in, in Daniel. And that means mighty ones, great ones, strong ones. And so it's a description. So in Genesis 6, 4, the Nephilim are called the mighty ones of old, the men of renown. And so Giborim is a description. It it, it applies to giants a lot, but not every time. It's used 158 times in the Old Testament, but not always for giants. Sometimes it's used for the mighty strength of God. So you have to understand the context. So everybody who jumps and says, gibbering, gibbering, giant, no, 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 no. What's the context? Classic example would be Nimrod, who becomes the mighty one in Genesis 10. Well, he's the son of Cush. So he, he, he's not the son of an angel right so we know the genealogy and so he becomes a gibberim whatever that means a mighty one and he was a mighty hunter and a warrior i think he was trying to emulate the giants and implemented their mystical religion at babel and was an antichrist type figure an archetypical fig figure of an antichrist after the flood but i'm he's not by definition, a Nephilim or a Raphaim. So Gibberim is that word you have to be careful with, and it describes the giants or the Nephilim in Genesis 6-4. And the men of renown, uh, the renown goes back to the to Hebrew word Shem and is rooted in Shemaim. 
uh, being famous. In this case, it would be infamous. And Shemaim, the plural from Shema, is plural for the heavens. And the I am as the plural can also mean one. So they're the men of renown, men of the heavenly, heavenly ones. The offspring of the Nafal, which is the root word for Nafil, for Nephilim, which means fallen ones. They are the offspring of the fallen angels. So hopefully that separated and defined some of the terms. Definitely. Thank you. Uh, the secret societies play a essential role in all this because it seems to me that even people and not in the elitist sense do I mean this, but in the lowest caste, if you will, they seem to understand back in ancient times that there was a hierarchy at work, that there were non-human beings, if you will, that played some kind of role role yeah. in manipulating the destiny of mankind. Somehow that very basic concept was lost and it, it, it was only carried forth by the secret societies. Uh, can you give us an idea of what kind of secrets the secret societies were harboring and how it ties in to this conspiracy, which will eventually sure. result if it already hasn't yeah. started with the return yeah. of these fallen angels? Yeah, so for preface, only in the West have those separations been made and that comes with the Jesuits getting control of Catholicism with the seminary schools and education and with the Royal Society which is begat by Rosicrucians and Freemasons that are going to get control of the seminary schools outside of the Catholic Church and education and they're going to put this whole idea, ideology of prophecy and prehistory on the back burner, right? Okay, so if we understand that, that it's the polytheists in the West that are, are doing that, they're going to reintroduce the ideas when they're ready again. They're just doing that to lead people away, away from God, which is one of the goals of the sciences, to lead people away from God. And the other goals that they have with the seven sciences are to not give God credit for anything and to uh, degrade God and deny God and to honor their pantheon of gods. And you see all of that in education today, even with the idea that they're building temples for universities, which are mystery schools, and they have degrees like the secret societies do. And so they're learning philosophy, which is a derivative of the first three sciences, and is the theology and the directional dynamite of the seven sacred sciences and philosophy means uh, Sophia as in wisdom as in the goddess of wisdom, Sophia, and love for Philo. So the love of Sophia, love of the mother, mother goddess, love of, of wisdom is their theology that guides the seven sciences and harmonizes them and gives them direction. So understand all of that is, is kind of related. So back in the time of the creation of those sciences and the divining up into the mystery schools and the development of the Enochian mysticism of Enoch, son of Cain, you have the creation of the secret societies that are going to be used to develop these sciences. So when you get into Freemasonry, which is sort of the introductory level into adepthood in the hierarchy of secret societies, you have a set of people that they venerate as their patriarchs. This would be Cain. This would be Enoch. Of course, they would say to conflate, as I said earlier, that would be Enoch, son of Jared, so that they're not being uh, persecuted by the Roman church. <laughs> this is why they did that. Um, and Lamech, and there's two Lamechs, one in the Cain line, one in the Seth line, and Lamech's offspring, which again shows you that they're the descendants of the Cainite line. They also have as patriarchs Tubal Cain, Nama, Jubal, and Jubal. All of those develop sciences that are described in the Bible. And they're listed there for a reason to sort of let us let you know what they were kind of doing with this earthly wisdom that the Bible talks about, particularly in the New Testament, that you have to not fall prey to that earthly wisdom. It doesn't mean that knowledge is bad. It is, means that knowledge can be used for good or evil. 
And we have to understand that. And it's a double-edged sword. So I'm not against knowledge. Let me, let me be clear on that. So they, they have their patriarchs that go back to that. And they honored their pantheon of gods. So their gods are these fallen angels. They just have different names for them that you would uh, associate as, I mean, everybody knows the great architect of the universe, which is Lucifer. But Lucifer is an Italian word injected into English for a Hebrew word, which makes no sense. Um, the actual word is hail L in Isaiah 14, 12, which E-L is the... Uh, sort of the angel part lies in Michael or Gabriel or Azazel. So Azazel is one of their great angels who was unfairly punished just as Lucifer, as they like to call him, I like to call him Satan, has been unfairly punished. And it's this pantheon of gods that they represent because they receive this balance of knowledge, this illicit knowledge that allowed them to conquer the entire antediluvian world. And so they have allegories or vernacular names might be a better name for these different pantheons, which are all the same because they all go back to this Enochian mysticism. So the most common one for Freemasons is Osiris, Isis, and Horus, which is their Masonic trinity. And Isis is a mother goddess in, um, you know, probably an allegory for Rhea or uh Sophia would be another one, like the Queen of Heaven, and Osiris is an allegory for the sun god, which is um, Satan. And so you have different names for these same gods in every pantheon. So like Zeus would be an equivalent to um, Osiris. And in the Canaanite pantheon, Baal would be that equivalent. And in the Sumerian pantheon, you would have uh, Anki as that equivalent. Some people might say Anlil. It's a debatable argument. But also understand these ones also had parent gods. And that's a whole different rabbit hole we won't go, go down right now. But understand that it's the same sort of pantheon that they had. So on the parent gods, you have the same kinds of parent gods that are in each of them. And so um, we'll go down that just a little way just so that people know what I'm talking about. So the father or the parents of, of uh, Zeus, which is the most common pantheon that people would know, are Kronos and Rhea. So again, another god and goddess, right? So it's either that, and, and, the, and, and the Olympian gods, they rebelled as in all other pantheons against the parent gods at some point in time. So that's either an allegory or it actually happened. Um, what we do know is, is that we have gods after the flood again. I actually kind of lean a little bit more towards you have the parent gods before the flood. These are the ones that first go to the abyss. And then after the flood, you have replacement gods that are going to reign in the council of gods. And these are the Baalim. And Baal, out of the Canaanite pantheon, would be that sort of equivalent to that head god after the flood. And if they had a second incursion, those ones would have went to the abyss. And so when you get in the Bible, the term Balim, that's the plural again, that's that pantheon of gods that are in all the different sort of countries, whether it's the Philistines or the Canaanite country or um, in the Mount Hermon area and across the Jordan, it's the same group of angels, the Balim and Baal. Don't confuse the two. Um, otherwise, it sort of gets a bit confusing as you're trying to say, well, that, that's not really consistent. I thought that God was the God of these people. Well, it's the group of gods, right? So you have, um, you, you have that uh, vernacular names and those vernacular rituals to all of these religions around the world. Now, somehow, some way, all of this crosses the flood. So at Babel, you get all of this same sort of organizational structure. And Nimrod is an antichrist type figure over complete sway, and he imposes this Enochian mysticism. So somehow he gets a hold of this knowledge and the knowledge to build Babel City and the knowledge to build Babel Tower. And certainly one wouldn't expect Noah, and we don't have scripture to say that he did, taught Nimrod all of this 
knowledge that destroyed the flood because he's a monotheist. He would be following God. He would have the knowledge that the Sethites followed, but he wouldn't provide them with that religion. And so where does it come from? Well, after the flood, according to the Freemasons, and Albert Mackey is, you know, lists a lot of what's in the Polychronicon, which was the oral tradition, in a book called The History of Freemasonry, in different sort of legends that they consider their history. He talks about one of their patriarchs as Hermes and Hermes Trismegistus, which again, I'll talk about in the book in, in, in a lot of detail to understand that term. Hermes finds, and what, so he's one of three Hermes is basically what's going on with that. But he finds two pillars of Lamech and or Enoch. And there's two different legends in, in, in uh, history of Freemasonry on that. I cite them as being the pillars of Lamech because that's in the generation of the creation of the giants and then the flood. And what's interesting that people don't really know, don't really realize, is that the preamble to the flood is the creation of the giants in Genesis 6. And there's nothing that separates the creation of the giants from the introduction of Noah's commission and the flood story right? It's the same story, and they're, they're a main cause for the flood. And again, the churches never make that connection, because they don't want to make that connection, because they don't want to deal with it. So what's going on here is Hermes finds these two pillars, and it has the location of all the knowledge that was written down in 36,525 books, according to Masonic and Gnostic records, and they're hidden under the pyramids in seven vaults, stacked one on top of each other, and he brings this information back to Nimrod. So again, you can see how they parallel the stories all the way through just from a polytheist lens. And it's this knowledge that provides the ability to build Babel City, Babel Tower, where Nimrod will then initiate 1,000 into uh, the mason craft to build Babel City, Babel Tower using this knowledge and then impose this Enochian mysticism over the world again that destroyed uh, the antediluvian world. And the Masons, and there's two different terms, there's Freemasons and Masons. You can use them interchangeably, but the greater name for Masons is the ancient organization. The Freemasonary organization comes with the formation after the fall of the Templars, after 1307 and early into, say, by 1317 to the 1320s with the St. Clairs finding a home for some of the adepts from the Templars to form the Freemasonary organization and the movement to decentralize what was once housed all under the Templar society. But that's another rabbit hole. And so the Masons, the ancient Masons, uh, look at Nimrod in a very fond way as a large man, as a great warrior and a king, not necessarily as the giant, although other legends from other countries suggest that he was. But they do recognize him as their first grandmaster of Masonry after the flood who wrote the first constitution, which would not be updated until the time of the White Brotherhood in Heliopolis in just before Moses' times. And again, you sort of get that sort of connection that this knowledge and stuff going down through the mystery schools and this polytheism and secret societies are going to move forward. So the point of the matter is, is that not only do Western Gnostics, because Gnosticism is the religion of Freemasonry and Rosicrucianism and the Illuminati, and Freemasonry, Illuminati, Rosicrucianism, as you move up this trunk of the hierarchy, as opposed to the branches coming in, um, but you have this as the core religion. And this is part of Western society. These are the LB Gentians. These are the Cathars that almost overthrew Roman Catholicism in the Middle Ages, which was, again, the untold story of what was really going on, is that's how powerful they had become in conjunction with the Templars. And so the Roman Church moved against them, whether or not one agrees with that or not, or how they did it, but that was going on. It was a power struggle for two primary religions, and only you can only have one surviving in that battle of primary religions because they're just not copacetic. They're not symbiotic. They don't tend to live with each other. Although some will make the argument that the homogenization of 
Roman Catholicism is that sort of symbiotic relationship, but again, that's another rabbit hole. Um, so the, this is the start of masonry and secret societies after the flood with the great start of the mystical religions after the flood at Babel, and then the disbursement of the language for that religion to spread around the world and led by the two epicenters at Egypt, which is gonna develop Heliopolis where Hermes goes along with Mizram according to Masonic records and Nimrod stays in Sumer, which is the Shinar transliteration of Sumer as it's recorded in English from the Bible and in Chaldea and or in Babylon, it's all the same region and area. And those are gonna be the epicenters and sort of the head offices of this mystical religion as it branches out through these spreading people around the world and then feeding them the information they need to develop that religion in those different areas that are led by that council of gods. Well, We've almost reached the end of the, the first segment and you've given us an earful. Now, could you tie it up in this first segment? There seems to be a transition, obvious one, from the Old Testament to the New Testament. In, in the New Testament, the emphasis, of course, is on Jesus. And that's a whole can of worms because there's a lot of uh, suggestions as, as to the identity of Jesus and what his you know, his, his various names, various guises. In a nutshell, in the time we got left in this first segment, can you give us your understanding of where Jesus fits into this whole paradigm? Well, he's the resolution to the angelic rebellion and the resolution to the fall and Lucifer's revenge against Adam and Eve so that humankind can be raised in the future time to be like angels and to judge the angels that did all of the crimes against the physical world and against humanity. And so he is a product that uh, the fallen angels and the Raphaim after the flood, they know is coming. And those giant nations are going to lay in ambush and wait for the nation of hope to come along, Israel who, if they're white from the face of the earth, can't deliver the Messiah, right? So when Israel moves into the covenant land, which is the land for God, they moved there and squatted there on purpose to violate the land and to wait for Israel and then to try and wipe Israel out. So this war is for Israel's survival, yes, but also to remove the giants from the land and to be able to produce the Messiah through the tribe of Judah. And this is what they're going to be trying to prevent all through the post-Diluvian period, the, the spurious forces. And I use that word spurious a lot in the book. And if people look it up, they'll find out why in terms of the greater meaning that it has. So the question as to who Jesus is, is he is the word of God, which is who created the world at God's command. He's the word who becomes flesh and he's a spirit being that is brought into the world that who's going to atone for the world's sin through a sacrifice that the angels don't recognize is going to be happening. They've fallen angels at least. And the Holy Spirit develops within Mary, the soul and the, and the body that's going to be the dwelling space for the spirit, the word that is implanted into Mary so that he's not created in the same way as the Nephilim or the Rephaim are. So he only has a mother in this world and he has a father in the other world, the spirit world, who is going to teach the new covenant and the resolution to the angelic rebellion and to resolve, put in place what's going to resolve the issues of the angelic rebellion through the end time and the millennium. So it's, it's completely connected. So it's the, what I would say, it is the resurrection plan to resolve the rebellion and the creation of the giants and to ensure that the loyal angels are going to move into the future. And those who choose God with very little knowledge, but on faith, 
as opposed to angels who are already created immortal with intimate knowledge, but many still result because they have free choice and to allow things to happen through free choice because God is greater than free choice so that all the names of the book of life that were written before creation will be fulfilled. So there's a time frame. There's a divine ordained time frame and things need to play out. And Jesus is that access for the resurrection so that people can become like the sons of God, adopted sons of God, but through the resurrection, which is why the sons of God of the New Testament can't be the sons of God in Genesis 6 from that aspect of it. And Luke is very, very clear on it where he says there's going to be uh, no marriage, just as Matthew talks about no marriage in heaven, because after the resurrection, humans are going to be equal to angels and they'll be sons of the resurrection or the sons of God as it's described in that adoption process and other verses. So I know that was a little bit longer answer than what you're, that you're hoping for, but yeah, he's the solution to <laughs> the angelic rebellion and the fall of humans in, in Eden. Well, thank you for sharing that. And uh, no, that was that was a perfect encapsulation. Uh, you know, to round out this first segment. Uh, once again, Gary, could you give your website uh, to our listeners and viewers? The website that you can um, get a hold of me through is the Genesis Six Conspiracy dot com. That's Genesis Six with the number Six Conspiracy dot com. And on that website you'll find that there's a generous excerpt of all 98 chapters. So you'll get a good feel for whether or not it's the book for you or not. And although it probably doesn't help your audience uh, where you are, there are uh, a, there's a buy now um, icon where you can click over to barnesandnoble.com and amazon.com and amazon.ca or to the Kindle version. But there's also an ability to buy a signed copy. And so if you click on that and if you wanted the book and you wanted a signed copy, because I, I, I get told all the time it's not readily available through Amazon in New Zealand or Australia um, or in that area, I supply the book at the same price I ship to the United States at. So if you fill out the U.S. column, I will pick up the extra freight and I will ship it to you. So you can get a hold of the book that way. You can also get a hold of me on um, Facebook under Gary Wayne. Um, and you can, if you find me, it'll ha I'll have my book on there. So you'll see it. So you'll know which one that I am. And you can ask me questions or you can ask for documents anytime you want, or you can post on my timeline. It's an open timeline. And you can also get a hold of me through the website. There's a contact me, um, email, uh, button on there. Again, if you want to ask for particular documents or stuff, because I do have a, I do have a lot of documents on a lot of stuff that's in the book and more stuff that's not in the book as well. And uh, to our dear listeners and viewers out there, if you like what we do, if you believe in what we do, please go to the CosmicSwitchboard.com, sign up and become a member, and we'll see you at the top of the next segment.